came to order. Um, in terms of additions or deletions to the agenda, uh, I'm just going to note that uh, item 10.5 and 10.6, Municipal Joint Service Board, uh, those two items will be, um, we, were kind of, we put them on the agenda a little prematurely. We're waiting for some information which we haven't received yet. So those will be moved to a future agenda. So just uh, note that amendment. Are there any other amendments to the uh, agenda? Hearing none, a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Mayor Tanner, seconded by Councilor Thorburn. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Down to introduction of new staff. And we have our new uh, engineering services manager, Matthew Davidson, here. I can turn it over to uh, Mr. Feener to introduce him and tell us all the great things that Matt's going to do <laughs> in town of Bridgewater. No pressure. I am pleased to introduce Matthew Davidson. Uh, Matt joined our team in November as the engineering uh, service manager responsible for public works, targets, and transit. Uh, Matt is a professional engineer uh, with over 17 years of municipal engineering experience working with two other municipal units. Uh, Matt enjoys living in Bridgewater with his family and spends a lot of his time at the rink either playing hockey or coaching. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. In all of that, you didn't mention that he is very tall. <laughs> hey, I don't know how that's, did you put that on your resume? I would put that on my resume. Tall, dark, and handsome. Yeah, I could yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> that took a turn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, welcome, Matt. Thank you very uh, much. Try, the clock is here for you. We have 10 minutes to make your speech. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that would be very comfortable. Uh, no, thank you very much. I'm pleased to, to join the Bridgewater team uh, since moving to South Shore. Uh, it's been always a goal to work for the town. Uh, so I did work for Miss Pally of Lunenburg and Miss Pally of Chester before. Uh, so it's very nice to, to work and live in the community. And uh, certainly hoping that I can uh, work towards the continued success of Bridgewater. Well, thank you and welcome again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, down to announcements, members of council. Anything upcoming, Councilor Fajir? Yes, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to just um, inform the public of uh, two uh, talk events um, that we have this coming Thursday, and I'll just mention them both. Uh, the first one is uh, Talk uh, Bridgewater Memorial Arena, and this informal drop-in session will take place uh, this Thursday, January 30th at the South Shore Center from 10 a.m. to 4. Um, it's located at the New Living Room, uh, which is on the, uh, down, uh, sorry, at the northern, uh, near Northern Reflections and the source. Uh, so council will be doing different shifts there, so you can uh, feel free to stop by and provide your feedback. Um, so we'll be able to provide uh, the point preliminary concepts, renderings for the proposed renovation of the Bridgewater Memorial Arena. Arena, sorry. Um, so later that day, um, also um, talking uh, Bridgewater Memorial Arena, will be located um, from 6, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Des Brise Museum. Um, that's also on the Thursday, January 30th. Uh, so you can come to hear a presentation um, uh, of the, the former B BMA uh, and what the repurposing of the building will be, uh, such as a transit park and public use facility. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to ask questions and provide your input. You can, rake, you can make written submissions if you wish. Um, and we'll also be live streaming this on the Town of Bridgewater's Facebook page if you're not able to join us. So that's from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Des Brise Museum. Great. Thank you. Other announcements from what a few? New York account on you? Probably the most important one, Your Worship, <laughs> is uh, on Thursday, February the 13th at the museum. We will be celebrating the town's birthday. I think it's the 121st birthday for the Town of Bridgewater. There will be some live music and cake. Uh, and this museum's just been newly renovated. Uh, we've done some changes down there to make it more open, more accessible, and give us the space that we need. So please come down and join us on February 13th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. On the 1st, there's mark-making artist Tamara Deshuka 
will bring our month-long metaphoric installation and creating artwork. It's a month-long series, and it just keeps building on it day by day, so drop in and see it again. And on uh, February 8th at 2 p.m., again, poetry reading by Corey Levener. Corey will do a poetry reading followed by conversations and questions. And uh, again, the birthday party on Thursday the 13th from 6.30 to 8.30. That's it for the next couple of weeks. Great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Tanner. Uh, just congrats to our uh, PWB Social Lumberjacks team who uh, yeah. qualified for the uh, Chevrolet Good Deeds Cup, one of I think 10 teams across Canada. So they're, uh, they're, they raise money for the re uh, Veterans Recreational Therapy. And uh, if they win, uh, they get $100,000 donated to their charity of choice. So we encourage everybody to go to the Good Deeds Cup and watch their video, which counts as a vote. And uh, we hope, uh, hope they win the money. Wonderful. Charity. Awesome. Anything else from this side of the room? Um, just a reminder, as we do every year, we have our Volunteer Recognition Awards ceremony that uh, will be in the spring. And so this is the opportunity from now until uh, uh, award nominations must be received by February 7th. So if you think of a volunteer in the community um, or a group uh, or a family or a corporate uh, entity. You can either pick up the application form at uh, Town Hall here or on uh, our website at bridgewater.ca. So like I said, um, these must be received by February 7th. The representative volunteer award is one individual that's chosen by a committee uh, to be recognized by the Premier um, in the city on April 27th. And then we have again the family fa uh, volunteer award and the corporate volunteer award. So, Go to the website, or uh, you can email recreation at bridgewater.ca for more information. Um, the other announcement uh, came from last week, unfortunately, um, last Thursday with the passing of Stephen Sander. And um, those of you who will remember Mr. Sander as the gentleman who donated uh, over $200,000 towards the elementary school playground and a million dollars to the minimally invasive surgical suite at our regional hospital here. And um, I think just as importantly, or more importantly, uh, and just forgive me, because <laughs> I've been struggling with this all week, and I don't know why. I've met the man. Uh, I spent probably a total of eight hours with him, and the impact that he had is just, um, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with his passing. And it's because that time I spent with him um, and really his connection to this community. He only lived in Bridgewater for a couple of years. And he made his impact, really, on the West Coast, where he built a real estate empire. And that's not an exaggeration. He built a real estate empire. But Bridgewater, <coughs> despite originally being from India, he considered Bridgewater to be his hometown, only living here two years. And it's because of the people of this town that had such a huge impact on his life that that's how he thinks. And for those of us who, who met him uh, and we went to an event with him, he called himself a son of Bridgewater. The first building he built was called the Bridgewater. It faces Lionsgate Bridge in downtown Vancouver. So not a small building. Um, when we saw him in the fall of 2019, I was driving back from Lunenburg to Bridgewater with him, a drive that he had not taken in many, many, many decades. And we were rounding the corner just before you get to where Center School was, and of course it's not there. Uh, well, the courthouse isn't there, or the uh, jail isn't there. And he said, wasn't there like a county jail here? And isn't there a school around the corner? That's how much this community meant to him that he remembered almost every turn in every home that was on that route that he hadn't taken in four decades. And I take that drive every couple of weeks. I can't <coughs> tell you what house is there. And so while we thank Mr. Sander for his generosity of this community, he would thank us for our generosity. And I think that's something that we should not soon forget in this community who we are in terms of people that were so welcoming, because sometimes we're not, um, but also when you are welcoming, the impact you can have on that person as you pay it forward 
can turn into someone like Mr. Sander, who has given back literally millions and millions of dollars to communities across this country. So he will be missed, and our condolences are with his family at this time. Um, but as I said, he will not soon be forgotten. Councillor Thurman. I, I did read the other day about our social Mustangs winning the division for the first time in 35 years. I think that's quite an important milestone. Absolutely. We should be very proud. Yes. Lots Why to be proud stand? of in our community. We won the division. If there's no more announcements, we'll go down to delegations. And we have representatives here from Twin Bays Coalition. Uh, so I would welcome you to the podium. Um, if you don't mind introducing yourselves. As you walk down, you'll notice um, we have a clock here. <laughs> Don't take it personally. Actually, if you, if you can go to the uh, podium, I think it's probably easier, yeah? Um, don't take the clock personally. It's not there for you as much as it is for me. We, have a, we do have a 10 minute time limit for delegations, and I'm not very good at telling them when they get to 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, you'll be able to, to see your time, and, and this does not include council's questions. So um, if you could try to stick to the 10 minutes, that would be great. Mr. Mayor, yes. may I tell a small story outside the 10 minutes? How small is a small Tiny. story? Tiny. All right. Tiny. I'm an architect, and in my other life, I've done some work for this town. And this is my favorite story about Bridgewater, which I'll never forget. We had the police chief and the town manager in the same room, and the chief of police said, well, I think we ought to do it this way, because I have guns. <laughs> and the town manager said, oh, yes, but I do the budget, and I know you can't afford ammunition. All right, my name is Sid Demerick, and I'm known throughout Lunenburg County as Alex's dad. And I would like to introduce Alex's mom, Sandy, who's a valued member of the Twin Base Coalition. And I would like to introduce Jeff LeBoutlier, who's a valued member of the Twin Base Coalition. Now, the Twin Base Coalition is a group of concerned citizens from St. Margaret's Bay, Mahone Bay, Liverpool Bay, and the mouth of the LaHaye River. We are extremely concerned about the recent options given to CERMAC, a giant Norwegian company for open pen fish farms in those four bays. Uh, can someone advance the next slide? I think maybe we can. Oh, do we do that? Excellent. We are not alone. This is not a NIMBY movement. We, we are surrounded all around Nova Scotia by groups fighting the same battle as we are. And uh, they're all listed there. I'm not going to waste my 10 minutes reading them, but I would point out that the Atlantic Salmon Federation is a strong believer in our cause, as is the Ecology Action Center. Um, next slide, please. Oh, thanks. We believe in aquaculture. We believe aquaculture is one of the ways to feed a very hungry world. But we believe in land-based aquaculture, and land-based aquaculture is practiced successfully right here in Nova Scotia, and I will come back to that uh, later on in the presentation. Next slide. Um, I have a picture of Mahone Bay. I don't have a picture of St. Margaret's or Lunenburg or the mouth of the La Haye River, but the story is going to be the same. You need 25 meters of depth for a salmon farm. The area outlined in red is the 25 meters in depth. And I want to point out some really scary areas which are open for CERMAC. At the bottom left, uh, in the Lee of Second Peninsula, snuggled in against Bachman's Island, one of the gems of Mahone Bay, you could put a salmon net farm blocking the entrance to the Lunenburg Yacht Club. At the upper right-hand corner, you could put a salmon pen blocking the entrance to the East River, which has a multi-million dollar elver fishery. Uh, in the middle is where the world-famous Chester Rake Week happens. And Jeff will comment on this as we go along, but I want to emphasize that this is industrial farming on an industrial scale. A salmon farm just on the surface occupies about 30 acres of land. Those islands you see, there are about 40 islands there, and they average about 30 acres of land, or of water surface used up, sorry. 30 acres of water surface used up in our bay and 170 acres of bottom used up for anchors and cables and things. These are monster industrial units. They have a barge that, uh, that automatically feeds the fish. They are lit up all night long. 
they have they they make noise and they smell they aerate the water they pump the water around this is an industrial scale that you would not allow anywhere in Bridgewater except your industrial park and I'm at a loss as to why they would allow it in our front yards on our beautiful pristine base so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff who's going to talk in more particular about the disadvantages of open net pen salmon farms yeah um the um, thanks, Sid. The um, this is really I was really moved by your account of Mr. Sander. It's like it's uh, amazing, and um, we're so opposed to this. So, like we're really not welcoming, you know. As uh, maybe this the it, it's an abuse of the quality of life that we have here, and I think that's ultimately what brings us together. And if the, the Twin Pace Coalition, so we, we just started in, uh, just before Christmas and uh, trying to come up with a mission statement of what we're really all about. We're all uh, citizens, all volunteers, and we're working hard to keep our waters clean. And, um, uh, and we support, we, we really support the expansion of proven, profitable, exportable Nova Scotia aquacultural technology. We, we get universities turning out kids that are, uh, that, that, that have you know, masters and PhDs in uh, marine biology. We have P, you know, engineers who are working on this and apply those skills to land-based uh, technology. C encourage investment from, from our own people, our own pots of money into land-based closed containment. Don't invite people from Tokyo and Oslo to come in and, and pollute our bays with these noisy, stinky, smelly things. It just, if you wanna see what they're like, go to Bayswater and check it out. There's six pens uh, uh, off Bayswater. They've been going for 10 years, 12 years. Uh, they are polluting uh, Bayswater Beach. Uh, at night, uh, well, anytime during the day, there's this grinding diesel motors aerating the water, trying to, to keep oxygen going in so the fish can, can survive. And if they don't have that, you end up with you had in Newfoundland, two and a half million fish dying off, you read it in the paper. It's just extraordinary what we're, what we're bringing in. On the other hand, look at, what, look at what's happening with our closed containment operations. Um, well, we made a list. These are the things that come to us. This isn't necessarily our list. This is a list that comes to us emails. Yesterday we had close to 300 people in Mahone Bay at the center. It was an amazing event, live streamed. And uh, so people are telling us these are the things that they're hitting. There's all kinds of, uh, of uh, fish pens, open net pens in, uh, in, off Digby. And these are the thing, the, the feces is absolutely extraordinary, the quantity of feces. Aquaculture, the magazine of record for the industry, uh, says that each, net, each fish farm produces 65, uh, the same amount of feces as a, a town of 65,000 people. And in terms of the scale here, this is extraordinary. What CERMAC is applying for from the Nova Scotia government is 20 farms. Each farm can consist of eight to 14 net pens. Each pen is 50 meters across, half a football field. That's how big they are. 280 net pens in Nova Scotia filled with fish. That's what we get. Industrial scale is uh, sea lice, which are common. And, and their, their marketing uh, that they're doing is absolutely uh, amazing. Um, uh, we have our, our MLA actually says, oh, well, there's no sea lice here. Speak to any fisherman, any lobster fisherman, and they'll tell you about the sea lice. So I, I, I'm going to turn this over to Sid now because I see we're running out of time and I'm, I am going on. But uh, it is uh, this list, all of these slides are available on our website, twinbays.ca, and uh, we're putting up um, a material which substantiates our argument there. So there you go. Thanks, Jeff. Can you go to the last slide? Uh, maybe we'll stop here. There are jobs at risk. Everybody's promoting the jobs that CERMAC will bring. We're going to lose more jobs than we gain. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Oops, sorry. 
I want to end on a positive note, Mayor and Councillors. There are four Nova Scotia firms on that chart, and I have visited them all, and they blew me away. The bottom one, Sustainable Blue, growing land-based farming in Nova Scotia, selling every pound of salmon they can make at a slight premium. They have perfected how to filter fresh water and filter salt water. Not an ounce of pollution leaves that site. At the top of the chart, sustained industries. Right here in Lunenburg County, they have perfected a way to deconstruct garbage into its component parts and decompose, deconstruct plastic, the plastic that China won't take anymore. Right here in Lunenburg County, they will reduce the Chester landfill by 90%. And the end product is diesel fuel and pellets which can be burned but which can also be fed to fish. Oberland, uh, it, the guy is a rocket science from scientist from NASA. He is growing soldier flies to make protein to feed the world and to feed fish. And on the other side, small foods, they have invented a process to grow algae in the dark and create a protein which is an exact match of animal protein. Imagine the benefits to the world of that. It can feed fish, but it can feed people. These are four industries that are right here in Nova Scotia, giving high-paid jobs. Um, Nova Scotia technology, ex exportable and scalable. These guys are going to save the world. CERMAC is going to pollute the world. We're at a crossroads. Are we going to pollute the world or save the world? Now, you might say, why can't we do both? Well, you can't, because these people are attracting brain power to Nova Scotia because Nova Scotia is pristine and uns relatively unspoiled. If we pollute it, we're not going to attract these wonderful people and we're not going to keep our own people. So we are literally at a crossroads. Pollute the world or save the world. And I vote to save the world for Alex's kids. Thank you. Look at that. Perfect timing. Thank you for your presentation. Questions from members of council? I probably should have laid this out at the beginning. Normally when we have a delegation, we receive the information and we don't make decisions the same night. We, we Certainly. Because questions tend to come you know, a few days from now or in the, sure. the middle of the night for me. Um, and so it gives us an opportunity to filter those questions back. We might have questions for you in a week or two that we need answers to. Um, and then, of course, we like to, uh, we would probably reach out in this case to the province to, to get some information from them. I know that um, there was a presentation made by the executive director of aquaculture today, uh, Bruce Hancock, to um, the mayors and wardens of the five municipalities that make up the region. And so, uh, of course, we all need to hear both sides and then try to make a decision with all the information that we have. Certainly. And we would be delighted to come back in a couple of weeks and answer questions and maybe suggest a motion that the council might consider. Does councillors have questions? Councillor Graves. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to the cause. It seems odd that the federal government would take salmon pens out of British Columbia but allow them here. Do you have any... Is there an explanation for that? There's no explanation whatsoever, but it certainly explains why CIRMEC is so anxious to be here because they are one of the biggest producers on the West Coast. Uh, we actually, I can answer that, I think, because we got the answer today, because we had the same question today. Yeah. So the answer is that we received was uh, in the West Coast, the pens are, it's Atlantic salmon in the pens, but Atlantic salmon is not native to Pacific. Yeah. Ours are... Atlantic salmon in Atlantic pens. So that, that was the rationale, although it doesn't really answer the other questions that you have. Um, but that, because I, we all had the same question. Why would you, what's the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast? And it was Atlantic salmon in the pens in the West Coast. I wonder if I could address, address that just slightly. Uh, the, um, uh, so um, on the West Coast, uh, they've had a, um, a, a long and um, vocal um, opposition to net pens from Alexander Morton and the David Suzuki Foundation and others, uh, concentrating primarily on uh, the endangerment of the native salmon stocks, largely from sea lice. On this coast, we have not defined, although we we fought the battle, God knows, from uh, 2009 to 2013 that resulted in the Dole Leahy report, that we, we did not uh, define the, the opposite side. What's endangered here is our tourism industry, huge. 
What's going? Are you are you going to pay to come to Nova Scotia if uh, you know, there's net pens and the machines uh, off the coast? You, can you can you play on the beaches when they're littered with uh, with debris and dead fish? So so we haven't defined enough. The people that are opposed to net pens coming, we haven't defined it as well as they did on the west coast. Here, what's endangered is the lobster industry, the tourism industry, and our native salmon stocks that have just disappeared with the advent of open net pens. Yes, Thurber. Mr. Pally, the District of Lundberg, the town of Bridgewater, are investing quite a bit of money to clean the river up, to make it so that you can swim into it. I'm just wondering what these pens will do in the areas where they're set up. Certainly somebody will have to model it, but I wonder, can you swim in those waters if, if they bring these pins here? It sounds like from what you're saying, you, you wouldn't be allowed. No, they, they destroy the bottom under those pins. They absolutely destroy it. And the figure, well, you guys would know this better than us, the figure of 65,000 people, that's six Bridgewaters. Yeah. Pooping. Yeah, well, why, why celebrate uh, Stella Bowles and, uh, you know, it's, do that, and then at the same time turn around and license fish farms. What, what, why would you do that? Why is it bad to put human waste in the river and, and not uh, fish? That's my question. Well, that's a very good question, and there's no, there's no logical answer to it. Sid and I had a meeting with CIRMAC uh, uh, last week, Sid? Yep. Yeah. And there were these three wonderful kids, bright kids, highly trained kids, and we said, we said to them, well, why why are you working for CERMAC? Why aren't you working for closed containment? Why aren't you helping us? Why are you trying to, to facilitate the export of our profits from our resources when we have at hand this incredible talent? And they, they were three ex perfect examples of it. It doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Catherine. Um, it, it's kind of um, funny that I believe during dinner, one of uh, Mr. Sanders' daughters told me that she either does or used to work for the David Suzuki Foundation, so it's a small world. But is that a resource that we could also reach out to and get some information? It would be very science-based, and, uh, th and there may be something online, but yeah. just in gathering information, yeah. I think that would be a really good source. Yeah, I think wherever wherever we need to gather the yeah. information from um, to get the questions answered and ensuring that we're obviously using fact-based information, then, yeah. So uh, whether it's going back to, to this group here or using some of the resources that you've, you've listed in your presentation, which we have a copy of, um, the David Suzuki Foundation, Ecology Action Center would have information as well. <coughs> Councilor McGinnis. Uh, yes. Uh, you say this is, a federal, this is regulated federally. Does the province have any say in this? The province has 100% say. For some reason, the feds cut a deal, and the feds are in charge on the west coast, and the individual provinces are in charge on the east coast. And that is one of our very serious problems, quite There's frankly. The, again, if I might just, it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, that's what people say, well, the west coast, it's federal jurisdiction, and here it's provincial. In fact, um, the, there are many, laws and regulations that are in the federal jurisdiction that apply to fish farms. Indeed, the province can license the fish farms in a particular location. But if they affect uh, wild stocks, if they affect uh, 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 treaties that Canada has with foreign countries, if it affects navigable waters, what used to be called the Navigable Waters Act, or if it comes under the Env Environment Act, there, there's a host of federal legislation which can be applied to the regulation of fish farms. So, so yes, uh, there's simply a memor memorandum of understanding between the feds and the province for fish farms in Nova Scotia. And, and it, it's our argument that that MOU should be looked at very carefully. And uh, we look forward to working with uh, Bernadette Jordan and the new Aquaculture Act in order to carve out some of the, the joint responsibilities between the province and the feds. We're working with uh, Eco Justice uh, on that right now. So. Have you had a, been able to have a meeting with the executive director for aquaculture? Just because it is the province that Not does the leasing of the, the uh, Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia, where he used to be. So, so we haven't since he moved into the the government department. We haven't, so, no. But okay. we just.
just started before Christmas. Right? So give no. Us a break. no, 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 <laughs> no. I was just curious, and, and I'm always curious to see if, if there's been an extension, like an invitation extended and not been uh, responded to, or if, it, if, like, if you're new, then of course, yeah, you're going to give no, yourself sure, some time. Yeah. We look forward to tipping in. Uh, CERMAC does do land based. Farming, correct? I'm, I'm told they, they in, uh, I think they do. So, so why, what, it must be a cost issue. It must be more expensive to build a facility on land. It's a, it's a question of scale. Yeah. Okay. So the the bigger it's 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 more labor uh, more cost intensive at the front end to do land based. Okay. But I couldn't believe going to uh, Sustainable Blue uh, two weeks ago. We yeah. How it has grown over the last six years. It's just amazing. And if you look you know, look check out. Uh, uh, Atlantic Sapphire, that's 600 million Norwegian US dollars from Norway going into building a land-based land closed containment in Florida. Right. Right. All the countries on Earth are moving toward, except here, Nova Scotia, we're not. Why? Why are we doing that? We actually asked the CERMAC reps, why wouldn't you do land-based here? Oh, they said you're too far from the markets. Well, we thought. We, we're not too far for the markets for the polluting kind of farming. Why are we too far from the markets for the good kind of farming? So we were too polite to say anything. Other questions from members of the council? No. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come back. We'll, uh, if we have questions, um, council will, will give their questions to staff who will then kind of relay them to them so we all get the same question and the same answer and we'll follow up. Excellent. Um, and, and if you wouldn't... If you would allow us, we'd like to come back in a couple of weeks and answer your questions. We will reach out to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for allowing us to do this. No, thanks for coming. Are there any other delegations from the public who wish to address council? Hearing none, we'll go down. Uh, the agenda of your minutes from the uh, January 13th regular council meeting in front of you. Any error or omissions? Hearing none. You all deem the minutes is approved, and we will go right down to reports and recommendations. And it is that year again where we are uh, appointing a returning officer for the 2020 municipal election. It is an election year in October. What is the wish of council? I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the chief administrative officer and appoint Amanda Shub as returning officer officer for the 2020 municipal and CSAP school board um, elections scheduled for October 17th, 2020. Seconded by Councilor McGinnis. Any discussion? Question. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Our next item is Bridgewater Museum Commission citizen appointment. Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Thorburn? I would move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of a cultural heritage and events coordinator and appoint Mike Williams to the Bridgewater Museum Commission for a three year period term effective immediately. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Graves. Sounds like a great guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any further discussion? Question. Question. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Just a reminder that uh, uh, this Thursday, evening is the public meeting about the Bridgewater Memorial Arena and it is at the museum and as uh, as was mentioned it has been renovated I'm excited to see the new, uh, the new look of the space next item is uh, RFP 2019-16 wastewater treatment plant heat pump heat study <laughs> heat power study sorry uh, did you want to run us through that just sure. very quickly Mr. Feener on December 23rd, the town received one submission for the heat power study at the wastewater treatment plant for a price of $87,009 full HST, which exceeds the approved budget of $15,000. Uh, the study was to include some uh, administration, preliminary and detailed design, and uh, necessary approvals. Uh, staff are recommending that council not award the RFP and that staff change the scope of work and reissue it, uh, excluding the energy generating component. <laughs> Why would we exclude the ener energy generating component? Isn't that a good thing? It's primarily the cost. So the 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 design component 
uh, and on-site project admin component is about $130,000 on what um, we expected the $15,000 budget would do. Uh, we are expecting that if we want to proceed with this type of um, infrastructure, we'd also have to increase the capital budget for next year. The replacement of the boilers in currently in at 250000 and based on the differences that we've seen so far, we likely would have to add probably a half million or so to that budget. So, and so have we done an ROI on that at all to see, you know, expense out, what comes in with recovery? We would, um, we would do that as part of the study and the design to see the benefits versus the cost. We only generate surplus gas in the summertime. So we would not be, uh, we would not have gas to make electricity all year round. It's only when we have surplus because we reuse the gas in the process anyhow. Yes. So I believe the deputy mayor, you're wondering kind of what would be our cost savings, and, or and, yeah, yeah. Cost versus, sorry, what would be our cost savings if we were to, to go to the energy generation component of it versus the capital that we would have to invest in it? Would we get our payback over? certain period of time or that would be part of the study part to of the determine analysis. what that would be if you know it'd be it be dependent on the type of equipment and such that would be determined through the preliminary and detailed design and then they would look at the amount of surplus that we would have that we wouldn't necessarily use in the process so we wouldn't be removing the analysis of the energy generation component this would be with this we this would would include that we we're suggesting not to go that route primarily because of the cost okay. we're looking at you're you're in the million dollar range so I'm I'm now confused mm -hmm. looking at some faces I think there's more confusion so if we if the motion is the way it's written it sounds like we're not even looking at factoring in the cost recovery of yeah. doing Right? Like, how, at what point are we going to find out if doing a system that generates and captures the gas and generates electricity, when are we going to find out if that is going to actually create some savings? You know what I mean? Like, if we're excluding that right off the, get, uh, off the bat, then aren't we doing one study to then eventually do another study and then potentially find out that we should have done it the first way? Do you know what I mean? Like, if the most effective way is to do it with the energy generation piece shouldn't we do that first we could discuss with the proponent potentially what the cost could be to do uh, I guess an analysis mm -hmm. if it can be done up front versus the full um, you know the full uh, design of such equipment we could explore that option if council wishes to do that I would anticipate it would be more probably than the uh, budget the approved budget right now. That's mm -hmm. McDonald. So I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying this, but if I'm buying a heat pump or something that's intended to save me money over time and, and add some efficiencies, typically they can give me some indication of on average people save this much. Is that some a question that can be asked in a case like this? Like on average, what could we expect to save? We know what the investment might be to give us a bit of a ballpark because I understand you don't know until you've done the study. But if we've got some ballparks, then we know whether we're gung-ho to invest in, in exploring that route or if we just, it's not worth it at this point. Um, the, this, this technology, this equipment would not be comparable to um, everyday heat pumps because there's a right. lot of them out here. Right. Uh, there's not a lot of these that would be uh, in the system. So we can certainly ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've utilized our on-site energy person throughout the process who's been providing, um, you know, professional opinions right. uh, on this as well. So we've involved our resources, our energy resources throughout this process. Okay, then kind of as feedback, I'd be interested in asking the questions and potentially increasing the budget mm -hmm. if it's worth exploring further. Yep. Uh, I think I think that's... I think we'd be foolish not to do that mm -hmm. to 
see if we can realize some savings. So I think that's going to be the recommendation is to not award this. Yeah. And then perhaps what we could do, Larry, is um, have that analysis completed before we move to any design phase. And that way, if the analysis came back and indicated that even though the capital may be half a million dollars more, that it made sense to do that from, you know, the numbers work that we would get our payback within an acceptable period of time, it made sense for us. We may actually want to proceed with, with that option. And if it doesn't, then we'll proceed with the conventional type boiler system that, that's being suggested. Does that sound yeah. like an acceptable approach? And if the analysis exceeds the budget, you'd like us to bring this back? Just the analysis component, we or can, is there? Okay. I, I would say we have fifteen thousand dollars in the budget, and if if it exceeds that, we'll report back to council to say how much do you want to spend to find this out. Great, okay. Council okay. sure. um, I'm assuming there's no concern with the time to do the analysis with any urgency for the project itself. So we have. It it, it was in 2017. There was an issue with this equipment, and parts were not available because the supplier um, basically closed their doors, okay. which is why we initially went out in 2017 looking to replace this equipment. But since then, after it went out to tender and prices came back, uh, there, the, the, there was another supplier that uh, we were able to source parts through, so we were able to repair it versus replace it at that time. So is there any way to wrap this into the smart cities funding? Like, mm -hmm. you just, no, you can't? Um, I don't believe so that smart yeah. cities had certain goals, yeah, that were more at the homeowner yeah. level. No, yeah. where you're going is the right direction, I think, in terms of smart technologies or, or um, I mean, we used to have a system that captured the methane or the gas, right? Like, I think we were way ahead of our time when it first mm -hmm. came <coughs> out. Were we not? And we kind of have to go back to where we were in a sense. Well, we would still be capturing the methane with, it, with redoing or replacing the boiler without the energy component, the energy generating component. We're still capturing the methane, reusing it in the process, saving us on oil. That's the, uh, currently that's the other fuel source. So we utilize all the methane that we produce now and then it's supplemented with oil. And in the summertime, we do generate some additional methane that doesn't get used in the process. Well, any, to, to me, anything we can do to make it as energy efficient as possible is good. And I'd hate for you to go down the road and do work and then have to redo the work. Um, so does everyone understand what we're... I do. Thinking? That last statement concerns me. Uh, you say that you're using methane now to replace oil? Yes, we've always reused the methane. So if we use the methane to generate electricity, we don't save what we use electricity. It would be additional. I assume that only the surplus methane that we would um, not use only in the summertime would be available to generate electricity. Would that be enough? That was That's what perfect. the study That's would what look we need at. To find out. Yeah. Questions still? Here. Just one. I'm just <laughs> this is very uh, interesting to me. Yeah. So as a growing town, I assume our methane levels increase and rise <laughs> naturally, so to speak. <laughs> Is that it's managed. What? Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, let me it's regular. Kind of phrase it. it, can, it, it, it uh, so it can. Yeah. Uh, the more well, we're you doing put a lot of a lot more work on our wastewater system. We yes. have plans to and so on. Does that yes. mean that we'll be funneling more product to the uh, <laughs> site and therefore generating more methane? I guess. Um, is that like logic? I think it would be very gradual. Okay. Our, 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 yeah. There's a joke about brand in there somewhere. It was fun to watch. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, so the motion, as I'm kind of hearing it from council, would be the, the same as the beginning of this, not to award the tender um, due to the bid, only bid exceeding the budget amount. And further, that staff. Uh, Revise and reissue the RFP as a an analysis as a learn, learn. to do an analysis on the. I, I, I believe we're going to reach out to the only proponent mm -hmm. to see what if they, they can, can provide us for the study. The, yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't be an RFP on the energy generation. Yeah. 
we would complete that analysis within the budget, and if not, we'd come back to council. So how do you want this? So it, <coughs> it would essentially be that, um, that uh, we not award the tender, and that staff be directed to uh, have an analysis completed on the options for the boiler that would look at both conventional and energy generation. Someone prepared to move that? Councillor Thurman, seconded by <laughs> Councillor McDonald. Did you get that? <laughs> I know you are. Uh, any further discussion? Question. Question being called, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Got it? Got it. <laughs> all right. Uh, next item is traffic light conflict monitoring testing equipment. and. I'm going to let you explain what that means so the public understand what conflict. I know what it means. But I know. Well, it's, yeah. Mr. Speer, do you want to explain so how that works? Just there's so that there's no confusion here. Traffic lights, I don't want people to. So <laughs> each, in each year we would bring somebody in to um, test the functionality of all of our traffic lights to ensure that they are working properly, that the programming is not in conflict with each other, that potentially could create accidents. And this company would uh, provide us with a report that says that each of those intersections are functioning properly. So this is the equipment uh, that allows that test to happen. Uh, the service is no longer available uh, from this uh, individual. There's only one that we were aware of. Uh, so this is actually the equipment to allow us to do the same service. And uh, we were paying, uh, it would be about a five-year payback, roughly. Gotcha, Thurman. So what were we paying, Larry? Uh, Around 3000 or 3, so, yeah. yeah. So it was sixteen thousand dollars, seventeen years. Deputy Mayor, so is this equipment monitoring the lights within a a set intersection, or does it compare against X intersection and another intersection? Just no, the one. It's just the individual. It's testing each of the components of that one intersection to make sure they're not in conflict with each other. So you don't have two green lights in two different directions. Correct. So if you have an accident, someone doesn't say my light was green. Well. No, my so, light was green. But isn't, isn't that just software that manages the light? Uh, not, well, no, oh. not these, um, not our lights. Okay. We actually have to have the equipment that connects to the computers. Okay. They're, they're individual computers. Okay. Yeah. Were, you, were you looking at a company at one point in regards to traffic lights, web based, and was there a company? We had some information from um, uh, an F uh, FCM comps, comps uh, was it two years ago? Not that I'm aware of. When you say web-based, you're... Yeah, there are sensors that were put on all the lights that would monitor the lights and uh, do traffic counts and... Um, yeah, I mean, there there is... Uh, a variety of different technologies, mm -hmm. including probably something that you're referring to. If there's issues, if we had the technology, we could get emails or, yeah. you know, there's all kinds of different systems that could be set up. Uh, uh, we don't have that technology with the equipment that we use. Um, so. Okay. Is it worth looking into? Like, okay. it, It's a matter of the level of service that we're, um, you know, providing to the public. Uh, there's lots of options that are, you know, that, that's available. It's just a matter of what level of service we feel is adequate for our users. So further to what Councillor Graves is saying, um, as we replace intersections and we upgrade those intersections, do we replace the controls for the traffic lights? Yes. That time. So if we do, does it make sense to replace it with something that gives you that capability as we go along? And if we are doing that, does it still make sense to buy this? 
equipment because the payback's five years and it's going to take longer than five years to replace all these lights? Or um, it, it may depend on whether you're doing, like if it's one intersection at a time, you still have to address the other. If you were to upgrade all of them at the same time, uh, you know, perhaps it may make sense to change the technology, but I'm not sure if council would have the appetite for us to redo a set of lights were about $180,000 to change over a set of lights with the technology that we're using now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilor McDonald. By a set of lights, do you mean a set of lights or an intersection? An intersection, okay. yeah. Councilor Graves. The company's Mile Vision. Yeah. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, we have some products from them. Okay. I'll send that along again. Okay, sorry, thanks. So it sounds like if we, we either do this and we do it in-house, or we're going to still contract this company that's going to... Mm -hmm. the, the, this company's company is not available any longer. That's why we so are there's looking There's no other replacement for them. So really, we don't have a choice, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, the choice would be not to test. Not buy and not test. So which isn't a good place to be. I don't like where that leads us, though. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? And this is done once a year. If we had our own, we would could do, do it, it more frequent. More frequent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Thurber? No, it, 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 we have to do it. We have no choice. Yeah. But I agree with Councilor Graves. If there's modern technology out there, the next set of lights we buy, it should be bought with the newest technology so we can use it on a go-forward basis. And if it's five or six years per time to get placed, at least then we can link the ones together that we purchase in the next few years and use a new technology, do our traffic counts and, and uh, studies that way. So if I can make a suggestion, um, when the next set of lights is upgraded, if you could, when we get the pricing back, if you could maybe give us a breakdown of this is what it is to do it as we normally do it today, sure. yeah. and this is what it would be to upgrade to the to the newer technology. And then, council at the time can make that decision. If it's five thousand dollars, maybe we do it. If it's twenty thousand dollars, it wouldn't make sense to do it. But that way, we get we we will make that decision, and we have to live with the decision. Does that make sense? Yep. If this contractor no longer exists, is there opportunity to share this equipment? Um, rent it out <laughs> um, it could be if other municipal units were interested uh, HRM of course has their own division and their own people to do it and their own equipment uh, TIR has their own stuff mm -hmm. as far as other municipal units I don't think there's any that's near us that mm -hmm. are doing it yeah. but okay. it could be an option Councilor Thurman I don't think there's anything close by that has traffic lights it would just be TIR. TIR. Yeah. Just, uh... Valley? Somewhere in the valley? <laughs> Stretching now, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> what is the will of council? I would move that town council for the town of Bridgewater approve the purchase of the conflict monitor tester from Electro Mega Limited as presented in document 20-022 for 20000 $527.50, including HST, $18,615.05 net HST. Seconded by Councilor Regier. Further discussion? Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion's carried. I feel like I should have had a conflict monitor tester for my teenage boys. <laughs> 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 Our next item is uh, proposed changes to policy 51, inserts and billing. So uh, if you recall, at the last meeting we gave notice that we were going to um, make some changes to this policy that came about from the fact that sometimes we are asked to put some inserts into tax bills that don't really fit in the machine and from time to time is required the manual folding and stuffing of 3,600 tax bills with uh, hours of staff time. So this is to hopefully avoid that so that they can mm -hmm. go in the machine smoothly. Um, like motion. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approved the revised inserts and billings policy as presented in document 20-009 as policy 51 for the town effective immediately. Seconded by? That's <laughs> uh, discussion. 
Questions to the floor. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Our uh, next item is the Central Nova ATV Club request. Uh, and that was for access, uh, ATV off-road, off-highway vehicle access to Centennial Trail coming across the old rail bridge along behind the LCLC up to Victoria Road just past High Street. Um, council received a number of pieces of correspondence from uh, citizens in the town. Um, I would say, I can't say most were opposed because I think all but one were opposed. Um, I don't know if council also had conversations with people outside of that. Um, what is the wish of council? Motion. We can put a motion on the floor, sure. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater deny the request from Central Nova ATV Club as contained in document 19-032 for off-highway vehicles to access a portion of the Centennial Trail that connects Cookville and Hebville. Second by Councilor McDonald. Um, I will add that the ATV Association felt that uh, mm -hmm. they thought that there was still information that they would like to provide to Council. Um, but if you recall, this is ongoing uh, since last May, I believe, um, and uh, I believe Council had most of their questions, if not all their questions, answered. So I don't know if Council's still waiting for other information. Um, I know for me, I wasn't waiting on any more information. Um, Council McGinnis. Uh, I only received two, probably the rest of Council, saying from the same people, uh, two uh, individuals who are in favor of this and they both resided outside of town. Uh, I've had several in-town residents uh, uh, put a did set against any motorized vehicle being on that trail. I, uh, I need to share with you, I, I walk that trail regularly every weekend. Uh, there definitely are off-highway vehicles on that trail currently. Uh, it makes it incredibly hard to walk on particularly because of the ruts in the snow right now, there's, it's formed a nice ice surface. And so once you get past the bridge and onto the section that they sort of don't go on, it's a much cleaner trail to walk on and so on. And uh, the vehicles that are using it currently are, are tearing up that trail quite considerably actually. So, uh, so hopefully we can put an end to that shortly. Mm -hmm. Councilor McDonald. Um, I did hear from a, a few people who are in, f who are in favor of um, allowing access, but um, residents spoke pretty clearly and in large numbers, um, mostly against access. Um, I, I feel very strongly that our, our infrastructure isn't designed for this type of use, that there would be significant budget that would have to be put into it, not only for the surface itself, um, but I think within town we have certain expectations for safety and policing, and that's a consideration that would have to be added when you add motorized vehicles to, to the trail, and we're not currently prepared for that. Um, recognizing that, that I, I feel that there would be a significant impact to the budget um, to, to add some of those services and that, that proper maintenance and care, um, I, I would need to see that there was a, a significant benefit to residents, that there was something coming back to the community from um, this investment, and I'm not seeing that clearly. Um, so with, with all of those things in, in mind, I, I just I can't see opening the trails to, to ATV use. Yeah. Um, so I, I sit on the Bridgewater Active Transportation Committee and just looking from their lens um, and we're all about protecting and enhancing our green spaces um, and the trail being one of them. Uh, so uh, and this came up in discussion uh, at our uh, at our recent uh, committee but environmental concerns with with the noise pollution and erosion of the trail through through their wear and tear. Um, I've talked to uh, a number of people uh, that use the trail. Uh, common concern was heard regarding the safety uh, for all users, um, ensuring, ensuring that everybody's safety is there. Uh, we have many trail users, uh, groups from daycares to students, uh, dog walkers, uh, seniors, cyclists, uh, just to name a few. Um, like Councillor McDonald, I don't see the direct um, economic spin-off that we would uh, receive. Um, 
because uh, the ATV users would be passing through Bridgewater. They wouldn't be stopping, so they would be continuing on. This, this isn't their destination. Um, and another major concern is the crossing of the main streets and intersections here in the town of Bridgewater. So I won't be supporting the motion. Thank you. Or I'll be supporting the motion. Sorry, I was not in favor of ATV. Uh, Councillor Graves, then Councillor Thurman. Sure, no worries. Yeah, I also think that the uh, ATVs on the Centennial Trail will have a negative impact on health, safety, and wellness of uh, residents and uh, and visitors to the town of Bridgewater. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Thurman. I think I had a, a couple of town residents, I believe I could check my emails, that was in support of them, and certainly a couple from outside. Uh, I'm really concerned about, and haven't been on the trail like Andrew, they're using it now. And I think I suggested when we talked about this before of getting some cameras up there so we can kind of get an idea on how much it's being used and who's it being used by. I don't think the trail cameras are that expensive. I certainly, uh, it's overwhelming that our residents don't want that. And I don't think that I, as a counselor, can go against my resident's wishes. So okay. I, won't be, I will be supporting the motion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll just echo what everyone else has said. Um, I, I, do, I recall one letter received from someone in town in support, but like I said, the, all the other letters, all the other con correspondence from our residents were uh, against allowing off-highway vehicles in Bridgewater. Um, a couple of comments about um, uh, this would just be a burden <coughs> to the residents of the town. Um, we did hear in the presentation that uh, while allowing off-highway use uh, of our trails would open up some grants potentially from the province, it would still be that our staff would be required to do the maintenance and do the repair and the upkeep. Uh, hearing that their primary usage is in the spring and fall, um, because in the summer, as we heard in the presentation, it's too hot and too dusty. Well, we know with the weather in the spring and the fall, that is when you're doing the damage on the soft trail. Um, of course, we have daycares that use that trail uh, and the risk uh, of ATVs going through um, while there's kids on the trail, um, we're, a, we're a town, we're a, a busy town. And I don't know how you put that uh, densely populated area uh, with that trail running through it and then have vehicles potentially going through it at a, um, when there's children on the trail. And I know people are using it. I also know that it's been an excuse for allowing off-highway vehicles on the trails. Well, they're using it now, so you should just allow it. Well. That doesn't make any sense because it's illegal now and they're using it you don't see an illegal behavior over and over again in this decide that we should just make it all right um, we still have safety concerns and I'll go back to the fact that once again like Councillor Thurman said we are to represent the 8700 residents in the town of Bridgewater um, and the businesses which no businesses would reap an economic benefit of an ATV that is going along the trail nowhere near a business. They're not coming downtown. So for those who are watching online, we are not talking about allowing them to come downtown. They would only be on that section of trail that takes them along behind the LCLC and out to Victoria Road. They're not stopping and shopping, filling up gas, getting a burger. They're not spending any money in town. So all the costs are shouldered by the taxpayer of Bridgewater and there's none of the benefits. So at this time, I think it's been clear from the residents that they do not want this opened up to off-highway vehicles. That is our job. So the motion has been made and seconded. Are you ready for the question? Question. Question being called, all those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. There's no other business to come before council. We do have an in-camera meeting next door. A motion to adjourn. So Councilor Thorburn, seconded by <laughs> Councilor Fajir, we are adjourned. <laughs>